Good afternoon slash morning, depending on where you are. I'm Todd Healy, and on behalf of my partners in C3, I'd like to welcome you to our 23rd CNC. We've done this now several years, and the objective is always to bring you a speaker and a topic that you may not be exposed to somewhere else with a kind of a different message. And before we go any further, I'd like to thank Jose Ibarra, a good friend in Mexico City. This is his 23rd, you might have missed one in all these years, but Jose, thank you for being such a reliable participant for us. Uh, before we introduce the speaker, I'd like to take a, another opportunity to talk about the format of support logistics. If you would just put any questions you have in the Q&A, depending on Michael's time, he'll address those at the end of the presentation. And we have good news and bad news about Michael. The good news is he's on with us. The bad news is he had a last minute trip scheduled to Washington, D.C. Rumor has it, and Michael, you can address this after Roe introduces you, but rumor has it that you're out there to see how law is made. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Roe, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, when we talk about business, uh, you know, employees that are working a nine to five desk job or working as a pilot are gonna have very different experiences. But when you talk to them about management in their companies, they very well could have very similar experiences. Uh, conversely, you could have two people working the same job under two different managers, one who thinks it's a dream job, the other who thinks it's a nightmare. And the reason I bring all this up is that what it really comes down to is business culture. When you have a culture that is uh, very much present and alive in your business, and aligned across all uh, boards, your uh, motivation and your uh, success is just driven forward. When you're a company that does not have a strong culture, you're like a ship without a rudder. Today, we have Michael Kiabasa of the Kiabasa Smoked Meats Company, uh, who has experienced a lot of that uh, in his experience with Kiabasa Smoked Meats. Uh, Michael is the current CEO and chairman of the board and he was president for many years, and he has been an integral part of the company's cultural change and the massive growth over the past 15 years. In the past, uh, since 2015, Kiabasa Smoke Meats has also been recognized as the top workplace every single year by the San Antonio Express News, and we're so glad to have him here today. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ro, and I want to thank Todd and the whole C3 Financial uh, staff for inviting me to to speak today. It's a true honor to uh, to be here and and tell a little bit about my story and my and my journey. And uh, I want to thank all of y'all for taking time out of your day to uh, to listen to a sausage guy tell a story. I mean that's uh, uh, that I appreciate it very much and am honored and humbled to to be here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a question. Uh, to the to, to the group out here. And the question is, is how many of you in this audience have been ready to surrender? How many of you have hit a point where you're asking, is this really what I want or could there be a better way? Well, it was the summer of 2009 and I was there. I was uh, on the verge of burning out. I was tired. Isolate, felt isolated, frustrated. And then early one morning when I was having my daily conversation with God, I, I made a decision, a decision that changed my life, uh, my company, and the lives of a lot of people around me. And, and this is my story. So I'll ask you to go to the next slide here. My story starts with, with these folks right here, my grandparents, Juanita and Rufus Kilbasa. I, um, I never met my, my grandfather. Uh, he died before I was born, but, but my grandfather and my grandmother started our company, Kilboss Provision Company, in 1949. When my grandfather passed away of a brain tumor in, in, in 1960, my father had left college a couple of years earlier to help when he got sick and took over the business. And my dad did a great job. He expanded the business um, and a hog and cattle slaughtering, and he did. He did a. Uh, he grew the business steadily. He added a lot of new products, and um, and he did a great job. When I graduated from Southern Methodist University in in 1987, 
I fully expected to come back to work for, for the family company, but my dad said, not so fast. He said, uh, why don't you go work someplace else for a while? And then, uh, and then, and then you can give me a call if this is something you really want to do. So um, my degree was in uh, finance. And so I went and got a job as a credit an analyst at a, at, a, at a bank here in San Antonio. And, um, and that's really what I, I, uh, uh, I started my career in. After a couple of years of being in the banking industry, I, I called my dad up and I said, Dad, I'd really like for you to give me a shot at it uh, now. And, um, and he acquiesced. And so in the summer of 19, or actually it was the spring of 1987, I joined the family business. And you can see a picture of my dad and me on the next slide. Um, after That's joining great. the company, go ahead. I was just going to say, so when you joined the company, Michael, um, what was the business like then? I mean, was, was there anything that you immediately felt like was something that you noticed that you thought could change or maybe should change? How was the culture at that time? Yeah, great question, Russ. So uh, we were primarily a hog and cattle slaughtering company back in, in 1987. And about that was about 90% of our revenue. But I knew that uh, with my background um, in banking, that if we're going to really grow this, we, we really needed to focus on the sausage side of the business and de-emphasize the more commodity side of the business. So I, uh, I, I started to pivot that that uh, uh, pivot the company's focus away from the slaughtering side and, and onto the onto the uh, uh, more onto the building the brand the sausage brand and and keep in mind back in 1987 we did not sell our product to any grocery stores uh, mainstream grocery stores we sold to little mom and pop meat markets and grocery stores uh, mainly on the south and the east and the west side of San Antonio but we uh, we. We uh, we invested in a little marketing, and uh, there's there's another story about that we can talk about later. But we invested in marketing. We we uh, uh, built the brand steadily, and um, uh, ended up uh, exiting the the slaughtering business in 2003 and expanding our our sausage capacity in 2005. We. Uh, we expanded um, uh, our, our, our selling into, we, we started making a, a private label product for HEB, which is the only uh, private label product we make uh, to this day, but it was a, uh, HEB really helped get me, you know, brought me to the dance, so to speak. And so we really did a, a great job of executing on my strategy of getting away from the, the, the uh, slaughtering business and, and focusing in building the sausage brand. In fact, by 2009, we had built, we'd taken the sausage business from a little less than a million dollars in sales to about 20 million in sales. Um, but that's, that's where the whole story growth. begins. What's Sorry, that? I, was, I said, that's pretty incredible growth. Um, <laughs> No, and I'm sure it's due uh, in a large part, no doubt, to uh, being a graduate of the Cox School of Business over there at SMU. I hear that right. <laughs> stuff is programs in the finance world you can go through. I also hear the graduates tend to be very handsome. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, very good. Well, so why don't you talk a little bit about uh, how you got into HEB? Because that seems like it was a very pivotal shift in, in the growth of the company. Yeah, that's a that's a great, great, uh, great, great story. Um, so in 1989, I had uh, I had uh, uh, found this little packaging machine in the corner of one of our of our pack of our coolers, and it was a packaging machine, and you could put the sausage in there, and you could package it. And so <clears throat> I started selling. Um, to a few uh, mainstream grocery stores, Handy Andy was one of the big ones back in the in the late '80s, and uh, and then I got five HEBs um, that I could sell my product. And what I would do is I'd go on the weekends and I'd hand out samples, and people would tell me, "Michael, this is the best sausage I've ever I've ever eaten," and I would sell a ton of sausage on the weekends. So I went to H -E the, the HEB buyer. Um, 
And his name was David Luskbeck. And David was a great guy. Unfortunately, he's passed away, but wonderful man. And I said, David, you know, hey, here's my sales. And can I get some more stores? And he said, you know, Michael, you're doing a great job, but I'm over skewed on sausage. I've got too many sausage skews already. Um, just keep doing what you're doing and come back in six months. And so I was disappointed, but I came back. I did, kept doing what I was doing, handing out samples on the weekends and selling a lot of sausage. And people tell me it was great, best sausage they've ever eaten. So I went back in six months and I asked for some more stores again. And David gave me the same answer. Uh, he said, I'm just, I got too many sausage brands already. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Michael, I just can't add anymore. So, well, I got a little upset. I didn't get upset with him, but I just got a little frustrated internally. And I decided that uh, I was going to do something about it. So I called this guy named Carl Wigglesworth, who had a radio talk show on in San Antonio on WAI in the afternoons. Some of y'all may remember Carl Wigglesworth. And I said, Carl, this is what I do, and, and, and this is who I am, and I'd like for you to come down to the plant, and I'm going to give you a tour. You can meet Eli, our sausage maker, and meet Dad and everybody, and um, I want to see if this is something you can sell on your radio show. And so he said, sure, Michael. Came down, took the tour, tiny little plant, um, and uh, he, I gave him some sausage. He calls me the next day and says, man, Michael, this is great. I can sell this. I said, okay, here's the deal, Carl. I can only afford to buy three radio spots a week on your ad. I want to buy one on Thursday and two on Friday because that's when people do all their shopping for the weekend. And I said, Carl, you can talk about the family. You can talk about the small batch. You can talk about Eli. You can talk about whatever you want to talk about. But there are two things that I want you to hammer home when you're talking about our product on, on the radio. The first is if it's not the best sausage you've ever eaten, call Michael and he'll give you your money back. The second thing I want you to hammer home is if you can hear your voice, if they can hear your voice, Carl, they can find it at their local grocery store, which was a <laughs> bald face lie. I mean, it was, it was just a bold of a lie as you could tell. And my dad wanted to fire me at the time. He was like, Michael, we don't go broke refunding everybody's sausage. Um, uh, refunding their money for our sausage, you know, because by the way, Michael, there's a lot of good sausage made in central and South Texas. Um, he said, we're going to make our biggest, you know, customer, uh, opportunity mad. And I said, dad, don't worry about it. Trust me. We got to do something. Um, and so sure enough, he started running the ads and a couple of weeks later, I get a call from David and he said, you know, Michael, I don't know what's going on, but I'm starting to get some calls for your product. I'm going to give you these 10 stores. Can you handle them? I'm like, sure, I can. And uh, keep in mind, I got this one little tiny packaging machine. Um, two weeks later, he calls me back and he says, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I'm getting calls, a bunch of calls. I'm just going to, can you handle all 35 stores in San Antonio? And I said, sure, I can. And, and, um, and then, you know, a month later, he calls me and says, man, I'm getting calls from Corpus and Kerrville and Austin. I'm just going to authorize you for the whole company. Can you handle it? And I'm like, sure, I can. <laughs> so, uh, needless to say, I worked that little packaging machine to death, but <laughs> wow, so it worked. And, um, and the rest is history. That's how I got my start with them. That's pretty amazing. So between that point in time uh, and I guess around 2009, you said you basically took the business from around a million dollars a year to $20 million a year. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Wow. So that's obviously very successful. Um, but I know that, you know, things have changed since then. Um, I guess what was the the culture like kind of towards the end of that period and, and kind of where did you start to have your, your thoughts about making changes? Yeah, so, um, it, you know, typical family business kind of top down management style. My father was, um, you know, a great leader, but he was very top down. It was very much his, you know, people would come to him if there was a problem or come to him if there was a, you know, challenge. And, and I just adopted that, uh, that management style. That's kind of what you do, that leadership style. You just follow your father and, and, um, follow his style. So, I'd adopted that and, um, and, um, it's really been 
you know, running the business like that and kind of growing it that way. But that's really kind of where the story, my story really starts is um, 2009. We got grown from a million dollars to 20 million in sales. And um, I was on the verge of burnout. I was um, just really frustrated. Um, and so that morning I was on vacation with my wife in Mexico and I was looking out over the Pacific Ocean and I just said, you know, um, uh, having this conversation with God and I said, look, God, I've, I've done it my way for 22 years. I think I'm going to give you a shot at it now. And that's really what I said. I think I'm going to give you a shot at it now. And it was a, a moment of surrender. It was completely unplanned, uh, unexpected, and I was really unsure of what I was, what I was doing. But... Um, I will say my prayer life went from praying and hoping that God listened to me to praying and trusting him. And it was a real opportunity for me to uh, uh, take a step back and really start to listen and, um, and, and open myself up to new ideas. And that's exactly what I did. I, uh, uh, not too long after that, I was hosting a YPO retreat for our, our chapter in, in, down at Port Aransas, and I brought in a guy named Jim Warner to be our facilitator. And uh, at the end of our retreat, Jim asked us, uh, did, had one final, uh, uh, you know, kind of exercise to go through, and he asked us all to name an unconscious commitment that we had. And if you'll go to the next slide here, um, Oh, uh, that's not the slide I was looking for. Maybe one more slide. Nope, I go back. I, I, I must have not put this slide in there, but um, but he asked us to name an unconscious commitment. And I looked at Jim and I said, Jim, that's pure psychobabble. I'm perfectly conscious of every commitment I have. And he looked right back at me. He didn't even skip a beat. And he said, Michael, I've only known you for two days but I can tell you were full of unconscious commitments. And so I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> well, let me think about it for a moment. <laughs> and I thought about it and I said, okay, Jim, if I've got one unconscious commitment, it said, I've got to have my finger in every part of our business. He said, great, write that down. And then he asked me, he said, how do you do your unconscious commitment? I said, well, I'm the sales guy. I'm the procurement guy. If there's a problem with you know, production, they come... You know, they come and ask me what to do. Um, I'm the HR guy. He said, great, write that down. And then he asked me, um, how does that unconscious commitment serve you, me? How does it serve me? I said, well, makes you feel like I'm doing my job, makes you feel like I'm important, makes you feel like I'm in control. He said, great, write all that down. And then he asked me, what's at risk if you change? I said, well, loss of income, because if people make mistakes, it hits my income, not theirs. I said, loss of power. And if I'm completely honest, you know, probably loss of ego. And he said, great, write that down. And so I did. And then he asked me, is it working for you? And I said, no, it's not. I said, our top line's growing, but our bottom line's not. I'm frustrated. Uh, I know I'm not a, as good a leader as I could be. Um, I know this is spilling over into my family life and I'm not as good a father or husband as I'd like to be. He said, great, write that down. <laughs> so I did. And by the way, I keep this little notepad where I wrote all this stuff down with me every day in my backpack wow. to remind me. And, and then he said, and he asked me a question. He said, are you willing to change? And I said, yes, I am. And so he sat down with me and he, we, took a, we took a few minutes and he, he walked me through writing what he called a clean commitment statement, which was essentially working on the business rather than in the business. And so um, I went back to the plant the next day and I walked into the, uh, our VP of production's office. His name's Ishmael. And I said, Ishmael, from now on, I don't have anything to do with production. If you guys need me for something, if, if, if you need me, come get me. But otherwise, you handle it. 
And he looked right back at me, didn't skip a beat and said, Michael, it's about time. <laughs> I'm like, wow, if you ever needed validation, <laughs> there it was. So slowly I offloaded all of the things that I'd been doing or most of the things I'd been doing, like I offloaded all the meat procurement to this young lady named Stacy who had, had her master's degree from Texas A&M was eminently smarter than I am about me and really knew what, you know, what to, how to do this. I just said, so, you know, would you like to do this, Stacy? I'll show you the process. And she said, oh yeah, I'd love to. And so anyway, I did that with most of the items. I, I, I couldn't do it with all of them, but I did it with most of them. And, um, and what that allowed me to do is be able to step back a little bit and what I did with that extra time is I started taking guys out from the floor to, um, to lunch, just to get to know them a little bit better and help them, uh, help, help, just help get to know them. And so I take them out to lunch and I'd be wanting to find out about their personal life. And they didn't want to talk to me about business. <clears throat> the reason they wanted to talk to me about business is they, they did not like the culture at all. They said, Michael, we love working for you, but I hate my boss. And I learned right then that we had a big problem in our company that we needed to deal with. So, which changed my focus completely. And what I learned is we, had, over those 22 years, we had taken, we'd taken people who were great machine operators um, and put them in leadership positions without giving them any leadership training. I mean, it was not very smart, but that's what we did. And that's why we had so much dysfunction on the floor. So that's why we were making mistakes. So I went to my um, HR director at the time and I said, Rosalinda, we need to bring in a leadership development program. And that's when we stumbled on values-based leadership, which is a uh, leadership model that Ken Blanchard de developed in uh, the 1980s. And fortunately for us, Holt, um, the Holt companies here in San Antonio were an early adopter of values-based leadership. And it actually formed a company, a subsidiary that helped companies uh, institute values-based leadership into their, into their, into their uh, companies. And so I'd reached out to a guy named Guy Klumpner, one of the most fantastic men I've ever met in my life, who was president of Holt. And I said, um, I said, Guy, um, can you put me in touch with somebody that has uh, successfully implemented values-based leadership so that I kind of know what to expect? He said, sure. And so he put me in touch with a guy named Charlie Luck, who's the third generation of his family to run their stone quarry operation in the mid-Atlantic called the Luck Companies. And I called Charlie up and I, I, um, He's a YPO, and so we talked a little bit about YPO. And then I said, hey, tell me a little bit about values-based leadership. And for the next 30 minutes, that's not an exaggeration. For the next 30 minutes, he basically grilled me on how tough I was and how committed I was to values-based leadership. And finally, I stopped him and I said, Charlie, what's the deal? I said, I just kind of want to find out where the landmines are. And he said, Michael, if you decide to implement values-based leadership into your, into your company. It will be the hardest thing you ever do. And I said, why? And he said, because values-based leadership isn't about fixing others. It's about fixing yourself. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, he said, look, if you'll, if you'll invest the cost of a plane ticket and come up to Richmond, you can see what this looks like. And, and so in person, and so I did, and I've, I uh, spent the day with him and his team and came back fully committed to instituting values-based leadership in our company after that meeting. So, you know, it's really interesting to me because you talk about how be right before that you were saying that you were going to lunch with your employees and they were telling you that they were having so much trouble with their bosses. And before that, you were in a position where you were had this unconscious uh, uh, commitment to uh, having your finger in all the different pieces of the business. So do you think that that culture, going back even further to your dad's leadership style of top-down management, I mean, does that kind of the culture that was percolating throughout 
all of kielbasa in your opinion absolutely. yeah absolutely no no doubt about it i mean <clears throat> people were paralyzed to make decisions they didn't want to make a decision they were afraid they're going to get hollered at if they made the wrong decision or if their decision didn't didn't pan out and so um yeah that's why they always came to me or my dad and said hey what do you want what do you think we should do well hell we're the we're not the people closest to the action so most times we made a suboptimal decision for them because we didn't have all the facts. We weren't actually working on the line. Um, so um, one of the things about values-based leadership is the first thing about values-based leadership is you identify your, your vision. I'll call it my, our purpose and your mission and your, and your, and your, your core values. And so if you pull up the next slide, um, you'll see what we came up with. And this is this took about six months to develop for us. And we refined it over the years. Um, and, um, and it took six months because I didn't want this coming from me or my family or even the senior staff. I wanted it coming from uh, the people on the floor. And so we put these focus groups together and we asked our, we asked our team, why do we exist? What is our purpose? And that's where we came up with, we exist to enrich lives. And then we identified, okay, how does that look in our business? And we put down these bullet points by providing a safe environment, <coughs> excuse me, by providing a safe environment, you know, by providing, by creating legendary eating experiences, et cetera. And then we asked ourselves, okay, what do we do? And that's not on here. We, 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 we've taken that out, but we, our mission is to craft authentic sausage and food products. Uh, and we don't, it's even more narrow than that now. It's really just sausage. And, um, and then we ask ourselves, okay, how are we going to do it? And that's where the values come in. Um, so the purpose, the why is our, is our vision. That the what is our mission. And the how is our core values. And so... The reason it took six months, again, is because we identified these and then we wanted to put some bullet points underneath each one of them so that we knew how to hold ourselves accountable to these, to these values. This created enormous clarity in our organization over what's important. We put this, side, this, this poster up in every office. We put it up in every, every uh, processing area of our business. We put it up in English. We put it up in Spanish and I told people, look, this is all you really need to know. This is our Bible. You can make a hundred thousand dollar mistake. And if you're in alignment with this, you're safe. You, you can make a hundred dollar mistake. And if you're not aligned with this, you're out of here. Again, enormous clarity in our organization. The other thing we did is we started teaching the five values-based leadership tools. Um, which are DISC, which is a personality profile uh, to help create improved communication, situational leadership, conflict resolution, principles of persuasion, and influencing. And we taught this to everyone in our organization. We taught it in English. We taught it in Spanish. For most people in our organization, it was the first time any employer had ever invested in any kind of training with them, and they soaked it up. They were total sponges. The other thing we started doing is we it changed the way we, we, we did our business. For instance, the way we hired, we used to hire off of technical skills. And really just technical skills. Hey, we needed a welder. We go find a welder. Well, now after this, after instituting values-based leadership, we started hiring off of values alignment first. Is this person aligned with our values? Are they adaptable? What is their learning aptitude? Can, are they a learner? Do they have a learner mindset? And then after all that, we would hire off of technical skills. And so it was, it was a complete change of how we did our business. We even started asking ourselves about our customers and our vendors and asking ourselves, do they align with our values? And some didn't. And we had to ask ourselves, you know, pretty hard question. Do we want to continue doing business with them? Some of them we didn't, you know, we had some conversations with them and you know, 
we didn't feel good about it, we left them. It also changed the way I showed up every day. I, um, I started being, we, we started building, making a conscious effort to build trust in the organization. And we did that primarily by being vulnerable with each other, especially me. And I started listening more and talking less, asking for feedback. Um, I started making a people list than a to-do list. Um, and what we, what we created here was a culturally safe environment where people felt empowered to take risk, um, fail fast, and lean into discomfort. And it was it was it was perfect timing for us because uh, we were getting this environment set because we were getting ready to go on a uh, pretty wild ride of growth. Because in twenty the same about the same time we were doing this, I brought in a new sales guy to really take off the last uh, you know, job that I had, which was which was sales. And I brought in a guy named Chuck Harris from Tyson Foods, um, who had actually grown up in Seguin. His family was part of the Holly Farms. Uh, if any of y'all remember Holly Farms Chicken, they were part of the Holly Farms Chicken uh, business. His grandfather started it. And anyway, I brought Chuck in to help take over our sales and take our sales to the next level. And boy, did he. Um, almost immediately, we started growing 25% a year. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is what we looked like from the outside. You know, we looked like this smoking hot Ferrari uh, driving down the highway. But go to the next slide. This is how we felt on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't have any of the systems or processes ready to handle that kind of growth. And we were broken. Uh, it was, it was really, it, we needed help. And so uh, I reached out to a, to a guy that I'd never even met before. He's an author of a book called uh, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits and Scaling Up. His name's Vern Harnish. And I emailed Vern and I said, Vern, this is who I am. This is what I do. Um, I'm, I, I've got this, I've got this rocket ship, you know, um, um, and I need help. Um, I basically to, to get granular here, there were two conversations going on in our business at this time. One was, Hey, Michael, uh, this is coming from my senior team. Hey, Michael, we need to start thinking about another building, another plant to keep up with our growth. <clears throat> that was one conversation. The conversation within my head was, hey, we need to start building cash because we're burning through all of our cash with increased inventories, higher receivables, you know, inefficiencies. And, um, and so Vern um, got right back to me, called me or emailed me back in 10 minutes and said, hey, you need to go buy a book called The Great Game of Business by Jack Stack. And I want you to read that book and I want you to go visit Jack in Springfield, Missouri. And so I read the book over a weekend and uh, 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 called, uh, actually called them and they were actually having what's, what they call their annual gathering of games, which is a practitioner's conference um, just a couple of weeks later. So I grabbed this young guy named Michael Johnson, who, who, is the complete opposite of me in our in our organization from a but you know a, a disc profile. I'm a high I and a secondary D, and he's a high C and a secondary S. And so I knew that if I brought him along with me, and we both thought this was a good idea to implement this, then we would uh, we we could do it. So I call him MJ. So MJ and I went up there and and um, and we would listen to the people talk during the day and then go grab a beer at night and we would kind of share what our thoughts were and we 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 both came to the same conclusion that look this this great game of business of opening up your books and creating financial transparency to your team so that you they can create a line you can create a line of sight for how their work affects the bottom line aligns so much with our core values and our purpose to enrich lives that if we didn't bring it in we'd be violating our own core values and so 
this is October of 2013. We 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 decided to open up the books and bring in the great game, bring in the great game of business into our system. And I was scared to death, Ro. I was scared to death because uh, we had, although our top line sales were were strong, we had lost more money in the last two months than we had made in most years. And I was afraid that all of the talent that I brought in over the last couple of years was going to go hit the door and say, man, I'm jumping off to this sinking ship. And the people who stayed were going to be so paralyzed with fear that they wouldn't do, we couldn't get anything done. <clears throat> but just the opposite happened. Just the opposite happened. The, the, the vulnerability the transparency of opening up the books magnified the trust that was building on our organization, which unleashed creativity. And immediately people started talking about how do we improve processes? How do we, how do we improve yields? How do we reduce waste? How do we cut expenses? Um, the weight of the world went off my shoulders onto theirs. And I became more of a coach than a boss. And I started teaching people how the company makes money, um, how we generate cash. And if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that we started, these are, these are, we put scoreboards up throughout our organization. We started talking, these are, these are team member led uh, conversations about how we, you know, what our KPIs are, how we're performing against our KPIs. And it just completely transformed the uh, our, our our business and um, and our culture, and um, it's it's and it's quite frankly transformed my life. Um, like you like uh, uh, you mentioned or Todd mentioned, we've been named the top workplace in San Antonio now for I think seven or eight straight years. Um, our our top line, we 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 we've grown six. X uh, as a company since we introduced values-based leadership and and open book management, the great game of business um, to our company. Our 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 bottom line is growing faster than our top line, which is nice. And um, it's just uh, I've never been more fulfilled in my life. It's truly an answered prayer. And um, and I I uh, I you know that the the I guess the the epilogue to this is that, you know, when I was back there in 2009 talking to God and, and um, telling him that I'm going to give him a shot, I said, look, God, if this works, which is kind of funny to say, God, if this works, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to tell people about it. So that's why I'm here today. <laughs> that's why I said yes. <laughs> well, thank God for that, Michael. We, uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. I took a look into the great game of business over the weekend and, and compared it with, uh, <laughs> with your, your company's family values. And it really, the overlap is quite incredible. It's, it's almost shocking that they're not part of the same. Well, they are part of the same system for you guys, but, uh, right. the, the overlap, I mean, especially, you know, you already had the family value of transparency and it's, you know, one of the most important aspects of the great game of business is, uh, knowing and teaching the rules, knowing the uh, critical numbers and opening the books. Right. And uh, the other thing that really, again, it goes back to your core values, but they really are. If I think about a small mom and pop family run business, you know, your family values that you are using across your company are the values that I would think a mom and pop shop would have. And I think it's so incredible that you've been able to expand that into a company the size of Kiabasa Smoke Meats. Uh, and again, I think it's a, a lot of it has to do with with your messaging um, and, and having uh, your values posted everywhere, like you said, and really getting um, every team member involved in every aspect of the business. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, um, you know, <clears throat> through the course of your journey, you know, you had this kind of team of advisors, if you will. Um, you had Jim Warner, who kind of gave you your talk about unconscious commitment and, you know, kind of your eureka moment of clarity about how the changes you need to make. 
And then you run into Ken Blanchard and Guy Clumper, Charlie Luck, who give you the values-based leadership. And then uh, Vern Harnish and Jack Stack getting you into the great game of business. Was there much of an ongoing conversation with those guys through the years? Uh, did they ever become aware of each other or work with each other on your behalf? Yeah, I don't know that they knew. Well, some of them knew of each other, but they've all been a big part of the journey. I mean, I still keep in touch with every one of them, um, some more than others, but um, Jim is still a very trusted advisor. I, you know, I, I, he's the center point of this, you know, really. I mean, he's the catalyst that got, he asked me the question. And so, uh, uh, he's a very important part of my life. Guy Klumpner is still my coach. I, uh, I go to Guy monthly and get coaching from him. Um, we still use him as a, uh, as a facilitator for a lot of our, our, uh, strategy meetings. Um, uh, you know, all of these guys are just such a big part of my life and my journey. Um, it's hard to quantify the impact. And that's kind of, honestly, I mean, you know, when you think about, um, you know, telling my story is to, is to really pay this forward and hopefully, um, you know, create, uh, plant a seed in, in someone's uh, mind over, hey, you know, maybe this could work for my company or maybe this could work for my organization. And, and um, it's really to encourage people to, to take this leap. I mean, opening up your books is, is, is not something that most private businesses to do, especially family companies do. Um, but I can just tell you from my experience, it's the smartest thing I ever did. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I implement my dad had a had a minor stroke in 2012, right as we were launching all this. And in 2013, when we when we decided that when I decided to bring in uh, uh, open book management and the great game of business, I didn't ask my dad for permission. I I, uh, I was president of the company, and I thought like, well, this is what they pay me to do to make these decisions. And so um, I didn't ask my I didn't really ask any of my family members that were owners if I could do it or not. Uh, but I did. Um, so, so about, I don't know, three months after we had launched uh, open book management, I, my dad comes down to the plant. He had come down to the plant a couple times a week. And I said, okay, dad, I want to show you something. And, and I wanted, I took him into the break room where we had this, think of think of an entire wall is basically our income statement. And we're forecasting out three months ahead of our uh, to, to forecast our business. That's the essence of the finance is you want to forecast your business so you can make decisions to help impact the future. So I'm walking my dad down the hall and I'm trying to explain to him what open book management is <laughs> a great game of business. And I'm stumbling and fumbling and I'm nervous as a tick. I just know he's going to you know, this, I mean, he's old school, right? I mean, you can keep all this stuff to your, <laughs> to yourself. You do not, you do not share your financials with your team. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I walk in and I walk him into this room and I said, dad, this is, this is what we're doing now. We're forecasting out and I've got everybody, you know, I'm trying to teach, give them a line of sight so how they can impact the numbers. And my dad, my dad's a man, a few words and and uh, and he was just looking at that wall, and I'm like, oh, this is not going to turn out well. <laughs> and he finally opens up his mouth, and he says, you know, Michael, I think this is the smartest thing you've ever done. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Breathe a sigh of relief, and, and, uh, and, and really, uh, I don't know if he believed that or if he's just trying to give me some validation, but, but it was probably one of the most important uh, pieces of validation I could have gotten. And, and as someone that's now done it for 10 years, I can tell you, it really is the smartest thing I've ever done. Michael, that, that really makes me curious about, you know, other family members that had a stakeholder, you know, were stakeholders yeah. and how all this was developing. How or what were you, did the process go to bring them along with this vision? Well, it's a great question, Carolyn. I, um, you know, I, uh, I'll be honest with you. I, 
I am much more of a beg for forgiveness guy than an ask for permission. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> and so I didn't really, I, I knew what I, I knew what the answer was going to be if I asked for permission, but I was so convinced that this was the right thing for the company to do that I just, you know, went all in and trusted my gut. And, um, and I think it, and, and basically I, you know, um, I, uh, I used, uh, examples from the book as, 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 uh, proof that this is a, this is a good idea and, um, and, and, and just brought people along. I'm sure there's family members that thought I was crazy, um, and, uh, maybe didn't appreciate it, but we we're pretty, you know, we, we, we ran, the, it was a pretty easy process because the, the business was pretty clean from a family perspective. It's not like we had a, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a family ranch that we were financing through the, through the business or, you know, lake house or beach house or anything like that. So it was, it was pretty clean from that perspective. I'm sure they're happy now. Um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I also wanted to ask you a little bit, you know, I guess about the power of goal alignment and, and coordination amongst your internal team. You know, you talked a little bit about Chuck Harris uh, taking over sales and, and MJ and Stacy with meat procurement and Ismail with uh, your with your production. Once you got into both the values based leadership and the great game of business, uh, I know, I guess, with all that transparency, were they, how much are they interacting with each other? They all, I mean, I'm, I don't think that your sales guys coming down and telling your production guy what to do or anything like that. But I mean, there is, is there transparency? Are they communicating with each other? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one of the, <clears throat> one of the really big pivots for me from a, you know, just from a management perspective was, um, it's really, it really shifted from management to leadership. And all of those people that you mentioned, um, I really started to focus on their leadership and tell them it's about leadership. You're not, it's not about getting, you know, you, you've got to hit the numbers, right? We've got to hit our targets, but it's really about how you get there. And, um, you know, I talk about this being a leader, a leadership journey for me, but it was a leadership journey for my entire leadership team. They had to change the way they led. They had to buy into the values-based leadership tools. And it's interesting, some of them did and some of them didn't. And the ones that didn't, I had to make a very challenging decision and difficult decision, but some of my leadership team did not make it. And that's Michael, just did, part of the deal. Did you yeah. have family members that were wanting to join the business similar like you did with your dad? I know that's often a, another challenging point with many of the business owners we have listening today. Right. Um, my, <clears throat> my cousin uh, joined our business um, sometime in the probably the early 2000s, around 2005. Um, and she ended up kind of running our community enrichment side, but not was never part of the kind of the core operating part of the business. Um, my aunt was there when I joined. So there were some, other, she was the only other family member there. Um, so my father really uh, was not, did not encourage family members to come in the business. I mean, it was a, it's a tough business mm -hmm. and um it's a, it, it was a challenging uh, business just for me and him, honestly. I mean, I had my way of uh, looking at the world. He had his way and that always didn't line up. And, um, uh, you know, so it, it's, it's, I mean, business, family businesses are challenging. And I think the more family members you have in there, quite frankly, the, the more challenging it becomes. So, uh, he was really uh, adamant about keeping the family members in the business down to a very minimal that, amount. And that encourage or that 
request or that you go work somewhere else. Yeah. Well, we eventually adopted a, you know, family business uh, policy where you had to go work outside of the business for uh, at least two years. Um, And then uh, you could apply for an opening. We weren't going to create create a job. In fact, my son had to go through that process about three years ago. And he, he approached me. I said, well, the rest of you can, you can apply. You can go look at the website and see if there's any openings on online that you that would interest you. And then we can, you know, we can give you, you can apply for it just like anyone else. <clears throat> My wow. wife wanted to kill me, but that was what, that was the rules. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm sure, I'm sure your wife was very pleased with you. Uh, you know, my wife, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, yeah. you mentioned it was, you know, there were some hard decisions that you had to make, you know, in the transition. And I was wondering, was, was your job harder before the transition than it is now? Was, was the transition piece the hardest part of it? And while you were going through that transition, what, other signs what kind of confidence did you have that you knew you were on the right track oh yeah i assume you're talking about the transition and 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 cultures is that correct yes yeah well i told you that my prayer life went from praying and hoping to praying and trusting and that's i cannot overemphasize that um uh, the trust part was big and I, you know, I, 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 uh, I have, I continue to have daily conversations with God many times a day and continue to, um, uh, to affirm that trust in him. Um, like I, I, uh, it, it's deaf. My, it's a different kind of, of challenge, um, uh, than it was before, but it's, but my challenge today is how do I become the best version of myself? How do I become the best leader? How do I become uh, a mentor to younger people in the organization? How do I, um, how do I support my, te- my, my other uh, senior team members? Um, how do I master, continue to uh, grow uh, and master the values-based leadership tools so that I can become the most effective leader I can be? How do I ask better questions? These are things that I think about now. Before, you know, I was thinking, uh, I wasn't thinking about those things. Certainly sounds a lot more fulfilling, I would think. Well, there's nothing more fulfilling than seeing your team succeed and seeing pe- people grow. And I have seen some members of my team really transform, not just their careers, but their personal lives. Because the great thing about the values-based leadership tools and the great thing about uh, financial literacy is that um, these are transferable tools. These are not uh, something that's only applicable to the the workplace. Uh, These are things you can take home, use with your your spouse, use with your children, uh, use with your, you know, your, 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 your close friends, they're going through a tough time. Uh, these are things that are, that are very impactful. And, uh, and that's, that's the most rewarding. Uh, that's, that's the most rewarding thing I can tell you right there. Absolutely, Michael. Well, um, I know uh, one thing that I heard you say not too long ago is uh, that your brand is a promise to your customer and it's uh, it's not people that are buying the sausage, but it's they're buying the reason that you do it. And I think that you and Kibasa Smoked Meats has really done a good job of helping build and enrich lives to, to go back to your family values and uh, I, I can't thank you enough for coming here today to uh, to talk with us and, and give us some of your time and, and share your journey. Well, thank you, Ro. I'm, I'm thrilled. You know, our culture has delivered 
um, this growth. And, 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 you know, Peter Drucker famously said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I'm living proof of that because we would not be the company we are today with the growth that we've had and the geographic expansion that we've had without our culture. Michael, I want to echo what Ro has said. It's been fabulous. Really, really appreciate you opening up and sharing with us. One of the questions that came in on the Q&A was, who else do you know, Michael, that went to Cox School of Business? Oh, well, there's a young man I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ro, well, he, doesn't, he doesn't meet all that criteria that he rattled off. Though, but yeah. Anyway, oh, Ro, Ro, seriously, Ro, go ahead. A wonderful graduate of the Cox School of Business. Yeah. It was a great institution high on the hilltop. Yes, sir. Absolutely. We're proud of that. Uh, Michael, we, I want to thank you. Go ahead, Ro. I was going to say we do have, if we've got uh, just a couple minutes, we've got a question in the, uh, in the Q&A. Um, Michael, do you find that when you grow the business to a higher level, it gets harder to find business consultants that can really help you? You know, uh, wow, what a great question. Um, you know, the, it's, it's interesting. So we're going through a process right now that um, we call it organizational alignment because we've grown, up, we've grown so much and we really, um, we do plan to take the company to the next level. And, and, and so we're identifying our business pillars and, and then trying to uh, align our processes. And so we, this is something that's pretty complicated and complex. And so we, we are bringing in somebody from the outside, but to answer the question, the first place that I go when I look for a consultant to help me is, um, is Guy Klumpner at Holt, because I want someone that understands a values-based culture. Uh, so many consultants don't get that. And um, if, if, if you don't get that, then your, your advice is going to be worth nothing to us, really, because um, culture, if you think about strategy, um, over, over strategy is this umbrella of culture. And then it's strategy, structure, process, people, resources that tie it all together. And so if we don't have someone that's culturally aligned, it's just like going back to our the question we have with our customers and vendors. Are they aligned with our values? If you're not aligned with our values, then it's going to be very challenging for us to, to be, be productive. So great question, but that's how we deal with it. Awesome. Thank you for that. And we have one more question. Uh, of all of your accomplishments with uh, Kibasa Smoked Meats, um, what is the one thing that you would say is your, your greatest accomplishment? Easy. Being named a top workplace. To me, to be able to, to have a workplace that's recognized as at that elite level um, it gives me more, more uh, pleasure than anything else. Um, that's, 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 that's something that we, um, and, and to see, to walk the floor and to see the smiling faces of our team members, to see the engagement. I can't tell you how many times we have customers walk through our plan and say, I've never seen the engagement from, from the floor uh, personnel that we see at your plant. Um, it, it's super exciting and just gives me, uh, gives me a lot of fuel. A lot of energy. Well, that's a great way to wrap it up as you talk about values-based because clearly your team is the thing that's so important to you. I want to make a quick personal note too. You know, you referenced the fact that when you turned it over to God, how important that was. And my family and I have been through two or three different things. And one time we went through it and said, God bless what we have done. Please bless what we've already done. And it didn't work. The second time we said, God, show us what you would have us do. Yeah. And it made all the difference in the world. Oh, yeah. 183 yeah. difference. Yeah. So thank yeah. you so much for all of your sharing and your testimony. And again, for those of us that had the pleasure of hearing you before, this just reinforces it. And also, again, we have recorded this, so it will be available for, it'll be on our website. And there'll be a connection back to your website as well, Michael. Thank you again to everybody on the call. And we're particularly to you, Michael, for sharing with us today. Safe travels back home. Thank you.